Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another week of Showtime with Jordan Van Haslow and friends here on Hot 702.5 FM. Today, I have a very, very wonderful special person, my good friend Lily Mace, the fantastically fabulous guitarist and musician and, and friend. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> totally. So I wanted to talk about, let me tell you, when I was thinking about like... <clears throat> I've been actually keeping a running list of folks I want to like have a conversation with on the show. You know, and every week the whole concept is that we have conversations with friends of mine, right? So it's not cold and it's not just like, oh, you know, what are you wearing and what are you doing? Um, and to talk about, you know, th things that are matter to us, you know, within the industry and within music and within, you know, film or whatever your specific um, <clears throat> discipline might be. And I've actually had you on the list as somebody that I wanted to um, have a conversation with here for a long time. I know we've been friends maybe. How long have you been in, New in L.A. now? Um, let's see. It's been a little over a year. I think I moved out quite suddenly um, at the very beginning of 2019 to accept an offer um, up at CalArts, kind of a strange offer um, that they made to be a student and a teacher at the same time. So <laughs> it's been, it happened really quickly. They told me December 10th of 2018, and I was in LA, like living in LA by January 5th. It was, it was wild. Okay, so, so when, I think we met not too long after that, maybe um, that spring. Yeah, that that sounds about right. And and, and I think you're so fun and what I also really love I also really love you you're always in my feed and I'm always reading you always write these really interesting posts on Facebook whether it's about you know something you just experienced that day you know whether you personally or like some kind of an aha moment you've had with one of your students and I always find them so insightful and so so I just, I just think you're just a really interesting person and so I really want to <laughs> kind of explore some of that. So just so, just so, like you know, those of us in the audience, those of us, uh, those of us who are those folks who are listening, <clears throat> just give them a little bit about your background. So you're originally from Albuquerque, and I know that you're the the daughter of a of your father was it was it was a, was a pretty famous guitarist in in Albuquerque, based in Albuquerque, and, and music's a bit of a family business. But tell us a little bit about your your journey. Yeah, I'm I'm from Corrales, New Mexico, which is actually adjacent to occupied Navajo land um, in New Mexico. It's sort of on the outside of Albuquerque. It's been kind of consumed by the um, westward expansion that we're doing these days, which is known as, as sort of urban sprawl. Um, but it was originally like a Mexican farming town. That's a little bit where my background is on my mother's side. Um, my father was was a sort of the guitar guru in the area. Um, he, his name was Steve Mace. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, very suddenly in 2016, which was uh, a horrible but transformative experience for me in terms of becoming like the sole member of what used to be a family approach to teaching and playing guitar. Um, I started playing when I was seven. I'm uh, I've had no I'm 37 now. I've been in the business since I was 15, so I'm, I'm sort of celebrating 22 years of teaching and playing guitar and 30 years of pursuing the instrument. Um, and that would have been in the late 80s, just to, I think 1989 that I started playing the guitar. And there simply were not any female role models. There were not really any women that were visible doing the thing at the time, um, which my father really graciously didn't point out to me until I was so far into the thing that I got hooked. So in some ways, I'm kind of an outlier in the industry just in that I persisted, which is not to say that there are not a lot of women that we haven't heard about that have been in the industry since the beginnings of the industry. But as we've gotten to be a little more systematized in the way that we educate people and in the way that we promote and profit from music, we have sort of handed the keys to something that I think of as being very minority-driven and um, in a lot of ways very female-driven into white corporate infrastructure. Um, and that kind of goes across the board that the guitar is sort of thought of as being like a man's man's thing. So um, it's been an interesting thing. I'm really involved now in sort of the taking back of that narrative into something that feels a little truer to where I come from, and we can totally talk like historically about, you know, how that's happened and why that's happened. Um, but the long and short of it is that nobody told me it was a weird thing for a little 
redheaded girl in the country to be really interested in playing the guitar. So I just kept after it. And so is that something? Up... Is that something? I don't mean to interrupt you, but is that something? <clears throat> yeah. Like for example, if your father hadn't been a guitarist, like, do you think that that you might not have had the same journey with the guitar? You might have put it down at a certain point. Absolutely. Um, I I think that, and I didn't even think about that at the time. Um, he, in a lot of ways, was one of the first feminists I ever met. Anything that I was interested in, he would teach me regardless of um, whether or not it was something that was typically taught in the home. Um, you have to remember that my mother's side of the family are, are Mexican immigrants, essentially, and even though that culture is very matriarchal in nature, there's also a lot of sense of, like, what sort of duties are, are given to the woman in the family structure because it's so family oriented. Um, and I sort of knew at an early age that I didn't have a lot of interest in um, homemaking or, or arts and crafts or, or um, I think I was involved in cotillion at one point and um, it was just not for me. Um, and, and those sorts of things were for my sister who was also a musician and has figured out how to integrate that into the idea of being also like a homemaker and a mother and a caretaker. Um, but the first thing that I got really excited about on the instrument was, uh, to be honest, Slash from Guns N' Roses and his guitar <laughs> playing. Um, and, and that for me became this sort of metaphor for what I thought of as being like female energy, which I know sounds very crazy because of the way the industry frames that kind of music, but there's something to me that's very lyrical and very wildly energetic and kind of like I don't know how better to say it kind of like gooey and like of the earth well it, what's so of interesting that style of guitar playing. I was just having this conversation with someone recently because I remember you know like <clears throat> Growing up in the 80s, you know, you'd hear heavy metal and it was just always thought of as this, this really loud, you know, almost un melodic noise, right? But when you listen to it, I feel like listening to it now, you realize, wow, these are really just kind of like really well-crafted pop songs that just have a lot of yeah, <laughs> distortion, absolutely. you know, like, just like <laughs> some really pretty melodies. And and, that, but when, yeah. when you take away the... Um, the marketing aesthetic of that stuff and the general dynamic range. Um, and you start looking at like the bones of what's underneath the songs. <laughs> Some of the greatest songs that have come out of like my generation of songwriters have definitely come out of that area, which was marketed as being like these kind of like boneheaded party dudes. Yeah. Um, right? But they have like, you know, two guitar harmonies and bridges with key changes and like sometimes metric modulations and, and all this beautiful part writing, um, you know, both instrumentally and vocally and, you know, songs that would have a chorus that would then come back later as a background vocal or something. It's like really, really wonderfully constructed um, things that were sort of masked as being this like for the masses pop music, uh, which I think is... <laughs> One of the reasons that I'm so fascinated in, in pop music from like a teaching standpoint and an intellectual standpoint is like, man, there's a lot of really functional information in there. Totally. So tell me this. is So as you were like, has teaching and performing always come hand in hand to you? Or was there like a point where you're like, oh, you know what? I really, you know, just discovered that I really dig kind of imparting the knowledge that I have to others or, or is it something that you kind of always did side by side from the moment that you began? Um, it's been a side by side thing for me. Um, as a family, we have sort of, uh, and it's kind of fallen to me to figure out sort of what these core values are, especially now that I'm part of like an educational institution, which to be honest, I never thought I would be a part of um, because music education is so codified in this like very European classical way and there's not a lot of room for the guitar and the way people learn the guitar in this system. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I would always just be teaching like privately to people that were interested. Um, and now I'm a part of this, this larger institution and I've become part of sort of, for lack of a better term, like reform party among um, music educators here where we're really starting to have a conversation about who gets to be taught and by who and what they get taught and why. And um, the guitar is like a really interesting breeding ground for those ideas because it's a really a learn by doing instrument. Mm -hmm. Like you, you have to just put your fingers on it and, and you learn 
to play by making sounds. And then I think that you learn um, to teach by by playing in some way. Like I, my my father was completely self taught, and he his method. Our method is very much about the idea of exploring the instrument in the way that is most intuitive to the instrument, not in the way the information is necessarily best laid out in a book. Right. So um, a lot of my knowledge has come from like using myself as a laboratory space. Like if, um, if there's a thing that I want to be able to teach or that I want to be able to do, I have to go out and get that knowledge. Like it's not going to come to me. We don't really have that kind of an educational, um, like pedagogical support for the guitar. Mm -hmm. So, um, if for, I will come up with questions like, um, that basically go, what would happen if, and then fill in the blank and then I'll go out and I'll live that. So in my early career, one of the questions was, what would happen if I moved to New York and started playing free jazz? Okay. Um, (laughs) It sounds like it sounds like you're the makings of like one of those, like, uh, what is his name? Morgan Spurlock shows. What would happen if? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's, you know, because, because there's no real effective, like, quote unquote, university system for teaching the guitar. Like if, if you want to know how something will impact your creative practice or your playing, you have to kind of go out and devise a learning system for yourself. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because, like I said, we have this very classical um, way of approaching music education and that was expanded in the 70s to include jazz as being also an elite art form. But then between what I would sort of call like the two pillars of music education in, in the academy, quote-unquote, um, is where all the guitar stuff is. Right. Like there's a little bit of guitar in the classical tradition, and there's a little bit of guitar in the jazz tradition as long as the guitar sort of tries to function like a saxophone or a piano. Right. Um, but in order to like really excel at that like academic version of jazz, you have to kind of really constrain yourself in terms of your imagination about what the guitar might be. Um, and I sort of found later in... Um, in my the sort of trajectory of my career that I was like sort of um, parched for guitar. Um, <laughs> and that came actually from immersing myself in the free jazz thing and figuring out how to make all these like guitar noises, like making music and crazy basements and doing like installations and all this stuff. And then realized that like I'd gotten so far away from that initial moment of excitement about like hearing Sweet Child of Mine or whatever on the radio <laughs> that I almost didn't recognize myself. <laughs> so how did you so how did you pivot so how did you how so how did you how did how did you pivot from that like once you realize wait a second no joke i put together an all-female well a couple of things happened um to to sort of like back up a little bit when i was a kid um there weren't any other ways to study music aside from classical and jazz and so i ended up getting a jazz education and sort of getting pretty fluent in that language and sort of you know all of the the proficiencies that come along with that, which have really saved my butt in a lot of settings. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've kept me from having to go out and get a job basically <laughs> my entire life, which has been amazing. <laughs> so I have a lot of gratitude for that. Um, because usually if somebody calls me up and says, Hey, I have X amount of dollars for a guitarist to do this thing, whatever the thing is, I, if I don't know how to do it, I can like figure out how to do it because I've sort of figured out how to learn you know, through sight reading or by ear or by playing with people um, right. in that sort of like fake it till you make it way. Um, but I did get the jazz education and that education was very, I went to the University of North Texas, which is an incredible music school that like was very disciplined in terms of, and rigorous in terms of the way that they produce instrumentalists. Um, so I was basically replicating saxophone solos from like the Charlie Parker era Mm -hmm. and then learning to sight read really, really intense things on demand. Kind of like in um, that movie Whiplash is kind of based around (laughs) um, some of the more jarring elements of like the education method that we went through as as North Texans. Um, And I not being really one for, for um, telling the line on things, very reactively got interested in noise music and like New York post rock and avant-garde and like free jazz and all this stuff. And so I 
I got out of school and I was living in Texas and was like, man, there are these people are, are not uh, interested in the things I'm interested in really. Um, and I just like picked myself up with $1,500 and a suitcase and a guitar and just popped up in New York. That's the um, way to do it. One day. That's the way to do it. It's like baptism <laughs> it's by fire, right? To do it. <laughs> did you yeah. know anybody or did you I mean, have I like know that? I you a similar... Very well. I will say this: I had a job when I came to New York. Like I, I came to New York with a show. Uh, I did come to New York. the show. Didn't last for very long, but I came to New York with a show. <laughs> so, I, so I give you a God, even no, more. I just, <laughs> I just popped up like, well, I hope this works. I mean, I was twenty-two. I think I hadn't even turned twenty-two yet. I like turned twenty-two like the month after I got there. And you know, I'm from a small town in New Mexico, and then I went to college in a small town outside of Dallas. So it was a hell of a transition for me. Yeah. Um, did you did you know anybody exactly, there? Did you have any like former classmates? Like any kind of a a network? Yeah, going there was a crew of us that kind of moved out over a six month period. Um, so my closest friend from college is this performance artist and and uh, sort of free improviser and classical composer named Nikki Diagostino. Uh, she's now like sort of a top call session guitarist in that noise scene because she doesn't have like really any interest in, in jazz language but she's very interested in improvising so um she did other things like Lydia Lunch and like she did a little thing with Dead Can't Dance and, and um like that sort of that sort of vibe and she had moved there and then all of the members of Snarky Puppy sort of tr which who were in um the same graduating class of jazz students that I was they sort of trickled up that year and um, it ended up being like kind of a crew of about twenty of us that looked out for each other. Okay. Um, which was really kind of a lifesaver. Um, a longtime collaborator and composer, dear friend of mine, um, Jeff Cook, who owns a recording studio out there now called Second Story Sound. He moved up, and we started doing like um, lost parties together, and and. Um, it's just working on all sorts of different things together. And that partnership has lasted now, like, let's see, we started working together in 2003. So, you know, um, had it, years, had it yeah. in two decades here. That's, yeah. Yeah. So, um, that was kind of like the thing is I'd shown up completely alone. I think I would have been just obliterated. Um, this tiny little girl with these like freckles and red hair and this Southern accent, you know, and these wide eyes <laughs> and, um, being from New Mexico in the 90s, which is like um, Breaking Bad era New Mexico, right? Um, <laughs> I was pretty street savvy. So, like, I wised up pretty fast to how the city works, but it was also, <laughs> it was quite an adjustment. Just the whole thing the weather, the subways. Um, but that's one of the cool things, though, about from place to place. being young, though, because I remember when I first moved to New York and like when the show closed, and I was like, screw this, I'm staying here. What took me so long to get the hell out of the Midwest? Yeah. Like, it, the one thing that's really awesome about being young is that you, you, you don't have enough life experience to know whether or not you should be afraid to do something. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, it was that thing in. about how, like, your brain doesn't develop enough to register, like, fear and awareness of consequences. That was totally me. <laughs> I was like, I have $1,500. What could possibly go for <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, And then it's just, like, the, the, some combination between, like, having, um, I mean, uh, the tireless, unwavering support of my pops um, in the face of all sorts of adversity out there, um, Definitely, it's like I had a second spine mm -hmm. in a way, so like it allowed me to walk through some pretty tricky stuff. Um, and also, not coming from a huge financial background, I kind of knew how to get by on not like a lot make of things. Money you knew kind of how to make feet. things work. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I would, yeah, and then, no, keep going. I'm sorry. Oh, go on. Oh no, I, I was, I, I, I was going to change the subject. That, I fell into the DIY scene. Oh, okay. Um, I fell into the DIY scene that was happening in Bushwick there. Um, and that became like my, again, like my life space for like, well, what would happen if, um, and so Jeff and I would ask kind of like absurd questions, like what would happen if we had a robot costume party and invited 500 people and presented our work that way as part of like a happening. So what did um, happen? And there was a lot of that happening. And what happened was, um, things that I'm, I'm, that I'm trying to present sort of 
to this institution that I'm a part of now, what happened is when people are confronted with challenging art in a social space and they're given the choice to lean in or back away from it, nine times out of ten they'll lean in because they've had a couple of drinks, they're moving around, they have autonomy, they can walk out of the room if they want to, they can walk back in, you know, they can check out entirely. And so given the choice, most of the time people don't want to miss out on like a, a once in a lifetime experience. Um, so we were really kind of on the forefront of that next wave of DIY that like came from the Soho thing in the seventies. Uh-huh. And um, that sort of solidified as things do into what's now thought of as um, immersive experiential theater. Right. So like sleep, sleep, sleep no, no more. more and all that. Um, it's so funny that you talk about like people having this inherent need to like not want to miss out anything on anything it makes me think yeah. one time quite a few years ago i was in london and you know i'm a night owl and i love my cable television you know they don't have at least at the time they didn't have especially in the, and especially hotels never have as many channels but they didn't have nearly any enough channels and you know of course the, all of the cable networks and stuff are different and i turn on this television program and it's black and white it's like maybe two in the morning and there's these two people sleeping and I'm just staring at it like, okay, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And finally, I'm just sitting here like, oh my God, I don't want to, like, I didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't do that because I'm like, okay, what's going to happen? Clearly something's about to happen. I look over at the clock and I realize that I had been watching two people sleep for 30 minutes, like some kind of a creeper. Wow. Turns, out, turns out it was like Big Brother, Big Brother After Dark. I guess they keep the cameras rolling. <laughs> but it just made me <laughs> You telling me that maybe things like, oh my God, I'm sitting here watching two people sleep simply because I don't want to miss what possibly might happen. <laughs> right. I mean, it's kind of a psychological thing about like if you're waiting on the subway and you're waiting for 10 minutes and uh-huh. then even waiting for 20 minutes. And then it's like, well, but if I leave and find another way to get there, like the train might come. As soon as you get up to the ground, exactly. The train. <laughs> so I'm just going to stay here and people will stay. I've done it for like 30, 45 minutes. Um, one of my biggest like growing moments as an artist and a teacher and as a person was learning to cut and run. Uh-huh. Right? Mm. <laughs> Be like, you know what? I've been waiting for four minutes for this train. I'm just going to get my ass in a cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> Totally. Well, so I want to go. Yeah. I want to go back because so we were we were initially we we were talking about you saying okay I'm moving to New York and I'm going to learn how to play free jazz and then realizing wait I've fallen down this jazz rabbit hole and I'm not really enjoying it and I said so how did you pivot and you said you started a band. Yeah. Well, there were a couple of reasons that I pivoted, and um, one of the reasons sort of became obvious to me upon reflection and and the reason is that there were no women and um i didn't realize how categorically unsafe i was as a person and also how incredibly edited my own work got as the only woman in the space right so um i took a lot of damage um i'm actually kind of internet famous for writing about it i was the first person to publish on the East Coast post Me Too, like personal accounts of what living in that part of the industry and elsewhere were actually like for women um, because we euphemize things a lot. Mm -hmm. So when you hear a woman say like, oh, you know how it goes in the business to another woman, uh, they're usually talking about like assault (laughs) or or something (laughs) close to it. It's not funny, but it's true. (laughs) It's it's totally true. Um, And and in that way, I, I became participating in my own euphemizing is my own like horrific experiences and um that that's like maybe for later on in this conversation but one of the things that happened is um i got a lot of sort of vibrational senses that i was not welcome in the room Mm -hmm. it was a real challenge i felt like i was always having to make space for myself and i was constantly being told that i was being too bossy or too dramatic or um not sensitive enough to my male colleagues need their feelings or inputs. Um, and a lot of times this would be in regards to music that I had written that I was writing paychecks for, a uh, modest paychecks, but still paychecks for, for people to play with me. Um, wow. That I started looking back at my earlier work and I started seeing less and less and less of myself mm-hmm. in my own work. Um, and I 
it got to a point where another thing happened, and the thing that happened is that the DIY area gentrified. So suddenly, like, the Times wrote this piece about how hip Bushwick was and all these people were living in these warehouses and then the warehouse that we were in um, that is still there. I think it's an artisan residency warehouse on Melrose Street, but um, the empty lot next to us, a condo sprung up. And so that was the end of our, like, experimenting with, um, you know, with, with uh, social spaces and all that because there were, like, people with day jobs living next to us in the middle of, like, the hood. Um, <laughs> and that the pioneers, had down as, like, they call themselves. Salon. It was very, in some ways, it was very synonymous with the Old West mentality that my family, who were immigrants on both sides, came to New Mexico with. Yeah, absolutely. Which is like, find a space, stake out your space, work hard, be kind, be generous. Like that version, complex version of the American dream that like we all know is a little mythologized, but like Mm -hmm. really kind of gives you some get up and go. (laughs) Um it was like very synonymous with that. And then the next thing that happened was that we created this fertile land essentially that was like, we'd driven um, just through sheer force of numbers of artists. We'd driven a lot of the um, more hostile forces out in terms of like drug and gang issues. And, and um, the city started like repairing the subway and all the things that happened in Soho essentially. And it sort of proved that the land was fertile for this new kind of incoming resident right. um and that incoming resident really liked living in condos and those condos were kind of diametrically opposed to the work we were doing partly because of the hours and the scope of the work and and all the loose edges that come with like living in a warehouse and making art for people to kind of have parties in mm-hmm. not super appealing to people with day jobs <laughs> <laughs> So it became, for some reason, you know, and now as a person with a job, I totally Now get you it get it. Us. You're like, <laughs> isn't it funny how that switch happens, um, right? Like, you know, from, from like being young and like, yeah, and let's do this and let's do it all night to like, hold on. It's like 10. It's but also like, up. I know better. So I moved into an apartment <laughs> complex in LA that's like a rest. I think moved into somebody else's warehouse district. No, this is true. This so is we true. had like folks coming down, like in venues that had like licenses to play music. We had folks coming downstairs to like small, not very loud, like jazz or experimental music concerts, coming downstairs through the fire escape from their apartments and unplugging people's amps. Oh my gosh. People are like that though. Yeah, it really felt like a hostile takeover. It was really just a a shift in values and it happened very quickly. But but Um, that ends up happening. You always wonder about people who move into places like that. Because I remember that happened like in like Chelsea and like remember when there used to be all the clubs, like the Roxy used to be there and uh, the park used to be there. And I feel like that was one of the issues that like the Roxy kept having was that all of a sudden they kept building all of these you know, condos, and then all of a sudden they kept getting a lot of noise violations. And and it's so funny because you think, okay, well, why would you want to live next door to a nightclub? I wouldn't want to live next door to a nightclub. But I imagine a person who buys something to live next door to a nightclub are doing it because they think it's kind of, like, cool. Like, yeah, I live next to the Roxy. But Yeah, it really felt like, like being – occupied by people that wanted your cachet but didn't want to be inconvenienced by the process of anyone actually making any art. Right, right. You right. know, but they wanted, like, the style and the credit, and they wanted to, like, look like the people that they saw in the, like, spreads on, like, Vice Magazine or whatever, which was us. Um, and ultimately, Vice Magazine participated in that and bought the buildings for a lot of the venues <laughs> that they got famous <laughs> writing about and, like, turn those buildings into office complexes and our art-making thing got, torn, like, taken down there, too. It happened, like, in a couple of waves like that. Mm-hmm. Um, where, uh, and and so that happened, and it made the, like, financial, you know, because you used to be able to throw an event like that, and they, they were rent parties, basically. You'd, like, pay your rent, mm-hmm. um, making your own art. And then I was giving guitar lessons on the side, and I think Jeff was, like, working in a recording studio a little bit. And between that and, like, traveling clinic work or things, we come up wedding gigs or something. Like, I was always okay financially. And the whole thing, like, cost of living went up. Everything just went crazy. Um, And I just realized, like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to start, like, actually participating in making a living part of being a guitarist. Like, it's happening. What is that going to look like for me? Um, And I 
ended up like after being this sort of avant garde and like really being immersed in this idea of making guitar music that was kind of anti guitar, like I wasn't using like any traditional sounds or anything, you know? Yeah. Um I a couple of things happened and one was that I started teaching a lot more and teaching younger folks um how to get excited about the guitar reminded me why I got excited about the guitar in the first place. Mm-hmm. And then I had that sense of feeling just perpetually unwelcome because I was dealing with all of these sort of dog whistle hazing stuff about my gender. And I had lived through, unfortunately, a number of assaults at this point, like from colleagues mostly, um, uh, some of which are kind of story things and some of which I haven't talked about too much. Um, but I was kind of in denial about that, but it still just made it feel like what I was doing creatively was impossible. And then I got entered into this heavy metal competition called Shred for Your Life as kind of a fluke. Um, uh, it's a long story how that happened, but um, in the process of like trying to remember why I got excited about the guitar in the first place, I uh, started like playing rock and roll again, and I got invited into this contest um, right at the beginning of that, and um, I won. Just which was I was the only female contestant, and it just sort of worked out. The game is like half sort of strategic and half about like playing. Um, it was sort of like a it's like a gong show meets guitar competition thing. It's pretty delightful actually. <laughs> um, celebration of like all the things that are ridiculous about the electric guitar. Um, so I won this thing, and for some reason, winning that thing which is a, a really goofy competition, um, want to give me a taste for what it feels like to play in front of a couple thousand people and make them happy. And I realized that, like, I would much rather be doing that than, like, in a basement living in fear of being assaulted playing for, like, 20 people that also understand, like, the abstract noises I'm making. Right. So I found, like, a real and radical shift in um, my own value system. And it was really interesting to watch that happen where um, I started getting really hungry for all the things that I wanted when I was like seven, musically speaking, like seven to nine years old. Um, And what weirdly happened for me out of that was this guy um, named J.P. Gilbert, who was a big metalhead and also had a jazz education, had a country band that just had gotten a production deal with these guys. Um, who like also produced Sleigh Bells and, and um, Vampire Weekend and stuff. Uh-huh. And they were making a record and getting ready to go on the road. And um, because this weird contest sort of told the dude that I was good at guitar, suddenly, without me changing anything about like what I was doing, um, I became a very interesting person to try to play with. Um, so I got offered this road gig touring with this country band. Um, and I in the spirit of the learning by doing thing that my family does, I said, yes, absolutely. I will do it. Um, not knowing anything at all about country music. Um, and I went out on the road with this band. I made a record with this band. Um, I went out on the road with them and it was a real trial by fire thing. And I realized that like, um, I'm so in love with the guitar Uh as an instrument that I am more interested in seeing how it fits in different, like, dialects of guitar playing Uh than I am in any specific kind of making music. And um, and, in that way, it kind of came full circle back around to the way my dad taught. Um, My dad became a teacher uh, when he decided to have a family, but his early experiences in the industry were um, working with Norman Petty, who produced Buddy Holly as a session guitarist in like the earliest part of the rock and roll session industry. So um, I'm still sort of unpacking the layers of how meaningful that is, that my family has been teaching and writing and recording and playing guitar for other people and for ourselves since the birth of rock and roll. Um, and and the more that the original guards sort of pass on, which a lot of them have, um, the more I am sort of in awe of the heaviness and the hugeness of that tradition. Right. Um, and, and how important it is to pay service to all these things that have kind of like saved my life. I would have made a miserable housewife. Um, I wasn't really geared for a traditional liberal arts education. Um, I would have made a terrible middle management person. I, I don't know what I would have done 
for a living and maybe become like an English teacher or something. I like to write, but I, I, I um, was not really geared for the traditional workforce at all as the way it was laid out for me in the 90s and yeah. 2000s. Um, so all of these contributions that all of these guys made on the road, learning by doing the same way I did, made it possible for me to figure out how to play country music and how to play the blues and like how to check back in with jazz in a way that's meaningful for me. Um, so and now you're not basically what like and now you're it's 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 it's, it's on you now to to kind of carry yeah that on. that's exactly yeah. it and it, it's been kind of uncanny. Um, well, I think it's a weird. I think it, I think it's a weird thing to kind of realize, like, oh my god, I'm not, you know, the 22 year old kid in the room anymore. Oh my goodness, I'm responsible for the 22 year old kid <laughs> in the room. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, to be honest, I thought I had another decade or so um, with my dad um, before the torch was passed, and he just he died very suddenly of like basically nothing. Oh wow. Um, he just like just checked out one day and like knew was news to all of us. I think to him, most of all, he like just bought a new car and a new TV. And we just put out a method book together called music theory. You could use, we we're writing a second one. Um, and all of a sudden I inherited like our entire intellectual property. Um, and that was a big transition for me from being like the understudy to being the archivist to then being the person that has to move all of that forward into whatever comes next um what so what 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 does that, what does that just before you move on with that like what does that feel like because i would imagine like just because i mean at one point I, I imagine a lot of it there's a lot of sentimental value there right and then i think i would think that, yeah like, you have a lot of issue like the youth the thought of like oh my goodness you know i need to protect this just so it lasts on. But then I would also think that there may be a part that's like, wait a second, this is actually marketable and can really be, you know, turned into like something that can, you know, for profit. Like what, what, what are all of those different things that kind of go through, maybe went through your head when it first happened and kind of where yeah. are you with that now? Um, to be honest, I'm still having a conversation with myself and with the industry about that. Um, mm -hmm. The, the real world thing that happened to me is like, I became, it was like, what was I? I was 32, 33. I just turned 33, maybe 34. It's not that long ago. It was just a few years ago. That I suddenly was responsible for an estate. And in the process of becoming responsible for an estate, which was mostly intellectual property and unfinished projects, by the way. So it was like archival work and finishing work. Um, I also ceased functioning as a human being mm -hmm. because I had just lost my dad, my business partner, my teacher, and my best friend. Just like all, he was a wonderful person. Anyone that had the chance to study with him, um, I've been on the receiving end of like many, many stories of people that have basically said like, your dad came into my life at a point in time that kind of saved my life. And that was like his legacy as a teacher was his ability to empathize with people to the point where, like, he was able to give them back meaning to things. Mm -hmm. Just through the guitar. It was an incredible thing. Um, so so that happened. And, um, let's see, he died October 2016. Okay. So what happened November 2016? The election. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> exactly. So, if you want to talk about like what it was like that two months from October first to December first, two thousand sixteen, where the whole country changed, like it was like a series of concentric circles of feeling like the world was ending. You was imagine, like, did I just like insane. walk into the twilight zone? Just in everything, I can only Man, imagine. Man, it was so crazy. Um, I I ended up, I was working as a DJ between tours um, in the West Village. I ended up getting beat up by uh, right-wing nationalists while I was working. In the West the Village? The weekend before the election. Yeah, like within a stone's throw from the stone wall. Oh my God. Yeah, it was really, for basically for looking liberal. Um it was really insane thing, and I had to take some time out to deal with that, like, physically and emotionally and financially. And then um, 
on the end of that, I was assaulted by a female employer on a private gig. And at the end of that, I was like, you know, I this whatever is happening energetically in New York that is causing the people to feel like they need to abuse each other to like prove a point. Like I can't be a part of this anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so I left. I basically made the decision because you know the whole question is like, okay, when you lose a parent. Um, do you drop everything and kind of like obsess over what their life was about? Or do you say, okay, they worked hard for me to have the life I have now. And do I just charge ahead? Um, and it worked out for me that I was able to make the choice to go back to New Mexico and just step into my father's shoes right where he'd left them and finish the archival work and give myself a pass on continuing to be in the New York session scene. Um, at this point, we kind of skipped over the starting of the band. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Point, like the, the thing that happened in between those two things, um, which might have some, some light on all of this, is I, um, I got back from the country tour, from the country band and, and from some other things, and um, the tokenization started happening in the industry in, in which, like, okay, we're going to start letting female performers through, but only in these, like, very self-exploitive ways. Um, and Such there's as. this, like, thing that I'm still in conversation with. Um, well, you know, lots of girls with guitars, you know, women who rock sort of talk. But um, um, the, the thing that happened weirdly as a way of transcending that, but then turned into this like weird feedback loop where, um, all female tribute bands. Mm-hmm. So there's like the famous one, Les Zeppelin. Um, and then there were a few others. There were like quite a few for a while. There was a Motley Crue tribute called girls, girls, girls. Um, there were a couple others. There was like a cover band called the Dandy Lions. Um, there's a guns and roses tribute called guns and hoses. And they were all very like, in this very, um, I, I basically, I, I got asked to audition for a couple of these bands, and I was really appalled by the low level of playing. Um, and I had one woman in particular suggest to me that what she did by like learning to, you know, just picking up a bass and then two months later being on stage was somehow more morally pure and to be congratulated, you know, that like I should feel bad about my music degree essentially. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> well, I, I wonder like, okay, the, you know, what's be... funny is that you wonder what she's doing now. <laughs> she's probably not still playing the bass yeah, on any stage. Yeah, I, I don't know. She had this, <laughs> well, it was always like a side gig for her and it was like, um, there became, it was the first time I became really aware of the fact that there's this huge intellectual bias between different kinds of music that causes people to actively resent or be afraid of or be suspicious of or dislike each other. And it's really built into the fabric of our, our country that we're really interested in the idea of separating things by class. Absolutely. But so you didn't, you didn't experience that stuff. in college at all? I mean, I... I, mean, I oh, I... Like, I remember, like, I... I stu- super experienced it in college. Um, but I was 19. Right. <laughs> so just in so terms of like contextualizing of it, it, like it really wasn't. What I experienced in college was like the, the purest form of that, which is like some older, largely white, largely male folks, most of whom were very well intentioned, but not all of them. Um, insisting to me that this thing that they were teaching me was the best way of doing things and therefore is the only way that smart people did it. Right. So if you want to talk about the thing that I think the academy as a whole should not be doing, what it should not be doing is, is just placing chips on kids' shoulders in an irrevocable way before the kids know who they are. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, that's what a lot of jazz education does. And that might be a statement, uh, maybe I'll wake up to like, <laughs> <a bunch laughs> like <of> email. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I say this as a person that loves jazz very much and is very well known in a lot of jazz circles and we play jazz together. And, and, um, um, but this idea of elevating, especially for guitarists, like one kind of guitar above another kind of guitar is like so problematic. And, and it really put me at odds with myself as a working class person who's like mom is from an immigrant community, Mexican immigrant community, and whose dad, my, my dad's family grew up on a homestead in Wyoming. So we're like as working class on both sides of the family as it 
skits um, to suddenly start seeing class distinctions between music like appear in my own playing. It took me honestly a decade to work past that stuff. Um, and it's a thing that I'm like actively teaching against now, um, partly because a lot of that stuff excludes things that women and minority voices are interested in totally. for no reason. Totally. No, absolutely. Well, let's talk about that. Let's let's jump forward a bit. So you you came out to L.A. Um, because of the job or you moved to L.A. and then got the job at, at, at your school? I, I came out to L.A. Um, my situation is a little interesting because of all these things that I, I sort of went through um, in academic music the first time around. And that's not to say that I didn't have um, some wonderful teachers. There, there were three guys at North Texas in particular, Fred Hamilton, Lynn Seaton, and John Murphy, who now runs the program that really looked out for me and really taught me a lot. But it's also where I heard things like um, I would I would go to... Um, I was the only woman in my program for the first three years that I was there. Um, and then the fourth year, there was a second woman, so the school was like, see, we fixed it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would go to, like, house parties, and as soon as I would walk in the building, someone would put, like, porn on the projection screen where they'd been showing, like, music videos or something. Um, I was hazed just terribly by all the men in the program mm -hmm. um, in, like, very obliquely sexual ways. And... Um, uh, I have a very clear memory of someone telling me that it was good that they finally had a woman in the program because I could help everyone keep their outfits coordinated for concert date. <laughs> seriously? Wow. Uh, seriously. Wow. Like, How do you respond Nate to that? Cook, I don't know. He's, like, like, what do you think? Like, um, like, like, <laughs> I literally could not. I was so <laughs> horrified. And so it was like one of those, it's like kind of like when someone grabs your butt and then like in public, like you and don't like, know whether you should laugh it later, off or be like, appalled or cry yeah, or like, exactly. like should have it. <laughs> so it, it reminded me very much of this this one time I was doing a photo shoot because I, I ended up running this all female tribute band for a while as a response to like well if this is the corner I'm going to be painted in then like I'm going to come out swinging from this corner so uh -huh. I, I started this Guns and Roses tribute myself um, and it it was rife with problems and a real learning experience for me as a band leader. I mean, as a guitarist, but also I'm really proud of what we made. I'm mean, only play a couple of times a year now um, as a band and as a business, but I have a memory in the early days of that band of doing a photo op. And right as his wife took the picture, he reached over and honked one of my boobs. Oh my God. And it seems so insane that someone would do that, that I didn't respond. Mm hmm. And that's kind of how my response to like the guy being like, you guys should, you, you can coordinate all our outfits. Like it didn't seem to me like that was actually a thing that was happening in the moment. So I was just like, uh huh. It's really interesting um, though, just how quickly <laughs> we've shifted as a culture, like post me too versus, cause when you kind of look back and like, we're both around the same age. Right. And like, just even growing yeah. up, you used to watch movies from like the 80s and you see things like, okay, Revenge of the Nerds came on. Like I was in a hotel like maybe, I don't know, a year ago. And you remember the movie Revenge of the Nerds? Um, I do. And and like and it came on. I was like, oh, my God, I haven't seen this since I was like a kid. I haven't seen this forever. And I'm watching it. And there's this like scene where the one guy, the one nerd dresses up in like the costume that the cool guy was wearing and bangs the cool guy's girlfriend at the carnival. And she right. thinks, and I'm watching this and I'm thinking, wait a second, did he just like rape her? And that was like, the, yeah. And, that was, yeah. and it was I like, mean, we're, 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 supposed be, we're supposed to be cheering him on. Like, you remember that movie Booty Call? <laughs> yeah, I remember like, Booty Call um, <laughs> with Jamie Foxx. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like unbelievable. Um, but we were really having conversations about consent on just like a sex level, let alone consent on a professionalism level or the idea that like you could be harassed or assaulted, like, you know, in subtle ways that change your way of being. Like we did not have the language for this stuff. In the same way, we didn't have language for like queerness back then really, right? You were like... Like, you were either gay or bi, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't have any of this this language that we have that we're just starting to have conversations with. Um, so, generationally, especially teaching kids now, I feel like I'm always going through these these modes of, like, rediscovering, like, like, like rebirth, in a sense, of, like, peeling away another layer of... of 
or going through another level of processing just because of we have kind of like realigning even your own kind of like what now. you think is uh, like realigning your own ideas of like oh this is this is correct and this isn't correct and kind of like navigating yeah. it through the eyes of these, yeah yeah so yeah. so basically you know i the me too thing was really huge for me i was in new mexico taking care of my dad's um archival work and sort of thinking about it, like deciding whether or not I could stay there and just be like a little guitar teacher and travel to New York and play and like try to have like a relationship and a family. What I kind of discovered when I got out from behind my guitar is like things, the situation for women who are visible as being powerful because of the thing that they do is there were some things about that that were really tough for me in terms of like being touched at gigs or like I had an internet stalker and all that. Being just an average woman and trying to get anything done in this country is fucking impossible. Yeah. Pardon my language. And um, it was amazing to me. Like I felt like I hadn't been treated with a lot of respect in the industry when I left the industry. It was like I was appalled at um, just the basic day to day of going through life as like a normal lady in New Mexico. It felt like it, possible to me um because i kept having to have these basic conversations with people about like why i didn't have kids or like <laughs> why i was getting my own oil change or, like, <laughs> all of these things and um so i was kind of living in this in this really remote area that in some ways is still really hung up on this like like um mexican machismo thing that is one of the the weird byproducts of of the culture that i come from originally sort of funneling into this american way of being um, and, uh, the Me Too thing hit and it happened in one day that I looked at a bunch of things that had happened to me in a new light. Right. Like, and I went back and I actually like relived in this reframing of people telling their stories of looking at sort of the coercion aspect of the Weinstein thing. Um, that I went back and looked at a bunch of things and realized that I had not consented to them. Um, and one of those things included an attempted assault from a former teacher at North Texas. Wow. Um, one of those things was an assault by a colleague while I was at a jazz workshop, a very famous jazz workshop that was covered up by the head of that workshop. Um, it was, and it, it, it clarified for me, like, oh, this is why I stopped composing and started playing in tribute bands and country bands, because I literally kept getting raped. Wow. Because that's what was happening to me. Wow. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> it was. Wow. It was an incredible, horrible day. Um, uh, made even more bizarre by the fact that the person I was dating at the time uh, couldn't handle it emotionally and just found himself busy. I was like, can you come like help me through this? And he was like, hey, it's kind of a drive for me. I'll be at home. Wow. Goodbye. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's basically how that that's, that's, um, that's crazy. So listen, I want to... It was super crazy. This is... I, 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 wanna, I wish we had hours and hours and hours to chat because there's so much more I want to ask you, but we only have um, so a so few minutes later. And I want to talk, talk about sweet... I, what'd you say? Yeah, I was putting this up. Let's talk about... Um, so long story short, I had... Um, I got invited back. I wrote a thing. The thing is called Playing Well Female. Um, it went. It was the first thing on the East Coast to get published about what it was like being in the music industry. There are other things that were published that were like higher level mm -hmm. um, as far as like the publications, but like Oprah called me. Um, I ended up like talking to rape crisis centers all over the country, which I'm not qualified to do. Um, but then a lot of people sort of reached out and brought me back to the industry, and that's how I ended up. Um, I ended up actually going and teaching at the workshop where I was assaulted, which is powerful. Um, and it made me realize how much the erasure of women from music was continuing to erase women in music in a way that was continuing and is still continuing them to, to put them in harm's way today. So um, one of the things that I'm doing at this school is really trying to bear witness to the imbalance and creating space as a teacher so that students can come in and take that space without even realizing that there needed to be a space made for them. Um, it's exhausting. <laughs> and in, in the middle of doing that, one thing that's happened for me here is I've gotten to be a part of an opera that's about that thing on a, on a national level. Um, it's called Sweetland. It's produced by the industry, and it's actually um, partly composed by someone whose family home is about two blocks south of my family home in Corrales. So that's been amazing for me to be a part of 
in L.A. to be a part of a piece of art about the land that we're from. Um, and it's an opera, and it's sung almost entirely by people of color. The orchestra is almost entirely women and people of color. It's really incredible thing to be a part of. And yeah. it's staged in the Los Angeles downtown historic park. Oh, cool. um, it's very, it's very challenging musically and um, spatially. It's like super challenging. You have to go in the cold at night to this park and like walk around and like, like the stage doesn't come to you. You have to go to it. Um, but it's been an incredible thing we get to be a part of. And it's really felt like one of those right place, right time where like I've had to peel away so much erasure within myself and my own story to understand on any tiny level the hugeness of what's happened to entire swaths of people in this country, including my own people who are being, you know, kept in cages at the border right now or ejected from this country's story, not to mention everything that's happened to to black communities here and to native communities here. Um so to be a part of a piece of work that just looks at that without even like trying to send a message aside from like, this is how complex our story is right now. Yeah. How, um, how long does it run? Been, it runs through the end of March. Okay. Um, I think it closes on the 22nd. They haven't announced the extension yet. Um, it's a little pricey. It's $75 a night. Uh, but it's really for people who want to see what, fine arts institutions could have been doing this whole time that have decided not to do. Um, this is a really wonderful statement of purpose, I think, in terms of saying, you know, if we just choose to tell different stories by different people with these same institutions, people like um, institutional devices, people will come and yeah. they'll participate. Yeah. So yeah. the only reason that we're not doing this, it's not a market thing or a level of interest thing. It's simply a matter of choice that comes from a certain kind of interest in maintaining a status quo that has not been kind to a lot of people who are actually pas passionate about music and art. Totally. Well, I definitely, I'm, I'm going to try to catch it before you close. And with that, my dear Millie, or Lily, we are out of time. God, it goes by so fast. I know. It, has, it goes by really fast and you're having fun. But thank you for joining me today. I think you're yeah, so... Yeah, thanks for asking. I'm glad it worked out that I had the hour to spare. Um, and I appreciate your interest in in the sort of bigger picture of what I do and why I've come to be doing it the way I do. Absolutely. I absolutely do. And I'm going to give you a buzz so we can get together and, and kind of keep on talking about that project that we've I been know. talking about. It. And I want to thank we all of our... We need to make some more music together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll be able to <laughs> announce something really, really soon. And I want to thank all of yeah, it would be great. our listeners as well. Thank you all. We'll see you back here next Monday at 5. Bye-bye. Fabulous. Bye.